Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Kempter. Thanks for coming. Uh, today's, or this time slot anyway, I'll be doing a talk on Postgres backup and recovery methods. Um, just a side note, if you guys have any questions during the talk, feel free to just throw up your hand or, or holler out, um, and we can do questions on the way. And I'll also have some time for questions at the end. So we'll do a little bit of an overview. We'll talk about the various backup options and restore options, primarily using pgdump and pgdumpall. And then we'll look at a uh, little bit in depth of the different ways that you can do a recovery. And then also we'll go into a point in time recovery, talk about how, how you do the backups, um, and walk through a step-by-step -step in terms of a, a true point in time recovery. So the, the main sort of snapshot style dump tools that, that Postgres offers are pgdump and pgdumpall. pgdump is a tool that is designed to back up with a variety of options a single database and pgdumpall uh, again with a number of options will dump the entire cluster. So pgdump is a dump utility that creates consistent backups even if the database is in use. It's non-blocking, although it's not non-resource intensive, if you will. So even though it's non-blocking, if you've got a, a significantly large database and you kick off a PG dump at you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on your busiest day, uh, you're, you're going to see an impact. However, it's, it's not going to be an impact because tables are blocked. Actually, it would be the other way. It is possible that the database would have tables blocked long enough that pgdump will actually time out and say, I, I, can't, I can't do the dump at this time. Uh, the, again, there's a number of, of output file options and formats. There's a number of options in terms of what you want to dump and what format you want to dump it, and so on and so forth. The syntax for pgdump is uh, obviously pgdump, and we pass it connection options, which are optional. And then we also can pass it a number of flags would tell it how we want it to operate. The connection options are the standard PSQL connection options. Dash H for host, dash V for port, uh, user, and you can tell it to, I want you to prompt me for a password with the dash W. Likewise, pgdump and pgdump all will both respect the standard environment variables, pg database, pg host, pg port, and pg user. So if those are set, uh, that is the variables that will be used for the connection uh, that pgdump makes to your, to your cluster. Some of the common options, these aren't all the options, but some of the more common options for pgdump is the dash A flag says only dump data. Uh, the dash capital C or the dash dash clean version of it effectively puts a uh, a drop database command in the output file, and likewise, a create database command. Uh, I'm sorry, the clean just does the drop, the dash C, and the dash capital C, create, will give you a create database command. Uh, dash D will give you singleton inserts. By default, pgdump will give you copy statements. Um, you can exclude schemas. We can dump only a particular schema. The exclude schema is actually pretty useful if you're running Sloney. So Sloney creates its own schema or schemas depending on how many databases you're replicating. And if you do a PG dump of a database that has a Sloney schema and then try to restore it on another box where Sloney's not installed, it'll actually fail because the functions it tries to restore require that the Sloney libraries exist. So the, a nice workaround for that is just don't dump the Sloney schema. Um, Likewise, the, the schema only flag says just dump the DDL, give me the create table statements and create index and so forth, but, but I don't want the data. You can specify individual tables or a list of tables. So you could say dash T table name, or you could say dash T um, like uh, part of a table name star, you can, and that works. Or you can give it a comma a separated list of tables. Uh, we can exclude tables in the same way. Uh, the verbose flag just gives you some debugging info. The format is pretty important, meaning 
the default format is just to dump you a, a standard clear text SQL file. And of course, the way to restore that is just with PSQL. However, you can, you can give it formats, like there's a custom format and a tar format. And tar format is obviously a tar compressed file. And a custom format is a custom compressed binary format. And both the tar and the custom format give you the option of restoring via a utility called PG Restore. We'll get into that in a few slides. But it does open up a world of options for you in terms of recoverability and um, in particular flexibility in terms of what, what objects, what data structures, what data sets you might or might not want to restore. It is maintained. So all of, the, all, all of your referential integrity are pushed to the end of the dump file. So it'll restore the tables and the primary keys and then it'll restore the data and then it restores all the uh, referential integrity. Um, likewise, there's a locked timeout wait. There is a default, I think it's 30 seconds, don't quote me on that. However, that's the amount of time it's going to wait if Postgres has a lock on a table due to what an application is doing. Um, given that PG dump is non-blocking, it's, it's going to wait. And if it waits the lock timeout amount of time, it'll actually exit and say, sorry, I, I, can't, I can't move forward. Um, if the default isn't working for you, you could set this to you know, something higher like two minutes or five minutes or whatever uh, to try to give PG dump more of an opportunity to uh, get itself in the queue, if you will, to, to grab a dump of that particular table. In terms of the, the file format options, we, we talked a little bit about this, but the default is do a plain, to do a plain format. So if you don't specify the dash F flag at all, you'll get uh, again, like I mentioned, just a flat, clear text SQL file. If you specify the dash C, that's the custom. It's a custom binary format. And likewise, the dash T is a tar format. You can also specify a compression level with a dash Z. So when you do either the C or the, the T, um, if you specify compression level, you can give it a 0 to 9. Of course, the trade-off is the higher the compression level, the longer it's going to take to, to do your dump. But the more disk, disk savings you get. Here's a, a couple of examples. So in this top example, we're dumping uh, insert-only statements, uh, including a create database statement. So the dash capital C, of course, gives us the create, the dash dash inserts, gives us insert statements. We're dumping a database called prod1 underscore db and redirecting it to a straight SQL file. In the second example, we're dumping a, a table called customer, and we're only dumping the data in a custom format, uh, again, from the prod1 db database. And likewise, we're redirecting that to a file called prod1db.cust.fc.dump. Um, the next example, we're dumping only the DDL of the prod1 db database and we're redirecting that to a straight sql file and the last example we have here we're dumping the gold schema um, and we're doing a tar format of the prod1 db database and redirecting that to to a dump file questions so far what is the gold schema? uh that's just something i made up so it's just whatever schema we happen to want to dump PG dump all, a uh, very similar utility. The difference is PG dump all dumps the entire cluster, whereas PG dump, you specify a database. Um, there are a couple of key components to PG dump all that are worth noting. Uh, the connection options are exactly the same. Uh, a lot of the common options are, are, are the same. So the data only and the clean, uh, you can do inserts, yada, yada, yada. Um, a couple of key differences here is the dash G flag, uh, the globals only, and the dash R flag, the roles only, are pretty, pretty useful in scenarios. For example, if you're setting up Sloney and you need to set up your database on the slave, you can use PG dump and get all the DDL and push it across for a particular database. And likewise, you could use, for example, the dash R to get just the roles from the master database and push it to the slave. Or you could do dash G and get all the globals, meaning you get the roles and the table spaces and all the global structures. However, uh, just beware that 
if you dump the table spaces, all, of course those same paths need to exist on your slave as well. Uh, likewise, you can tell it, um, I don't want you to put ownership in the file. Um, and I think everything else is mostly the same. Maybe the super user is different, so you could specify a different super user that you want to be uh, specified as the owner when you do a dump all. A couple of dump all examples. Uh, this top one, we're, we're doing an entire cluster dump containing only the, uh, the global structures. So we're doing the dash G. And the next one, we're dumping the, only the table spaces. And likewise, the third example, we're dumping a dump of the cluster without any table space references. Uh, and the final example, we're dumping the cluster and we're telling it to use the super user gold user and we're giving it a lock wait time out of 30 seconds. So if we wait more than 30 seconds on a lock, it will abort. Uh, any questions? Yes? Dump to a tape. So PG dump and PG dump all inherently, uh, the question was, is there any media manager support that allows us to dump to tape? And the short answer is no. Uh, PG dump and PG dump all don't support uh, the media protocols within the tool itself. However, we have done some work um, where we did go to tape and basically it's a two-step process. So we, we either go to disk and then from disk we have a, a, a command script that pushes that to tape or in what we did is in one scenario is we did the PG dump and we'll pipe that to the tape commands and it sends it straight onto the tape. However, um, it's, you, you have to go to the Unix command line and, and write your own, if you will. So restore options, that obviously when we're doing PG dump and PG dump all, our restore options are PSQL for the flat SQL files, or we can use PG restore, and it has a number of options, and it gives us a fair amount of flexibility in terms of how we want to restore and what we want to restore. Um, with PSQL, of course, if we've got just a flat, straight SQL file, we can do, uh, here's a couple examples, psql-ef of the SQL file. And in this case, the first example, we're just redirecting the output to a, a log file. Um, and in this case, uh, we also didn't give it a database name. So the assumption is that we're, we're connecting to the default database, which is gonna be set by the PG database environment variable. Um, likewise, we're, here's an example where we did a PG dump and we dumped the prod1 DB database and we're simply piping that to psql-h and redirecting that to our QA server in this case. Uh, there's another PG dump all, we're dumping only the globals and we're passing that to a psql-h of our dev server um, and we're giving it a different port and we're logging it. Uh, this is pretty similar to what we would do with Sloney is, you know, we would do the PG dump all dash G on the master and pipe it to PSQL dash H for the slave that we're setting up. Um, and then we'd come back and do the DDL. Likewise, the last example, we're doing a PG dump of the prod one database and piping that to PSQL on the test database and then we're, we're logging it. So pretty, pretty standard stuff in terms of restoring from PSQL files or .SQL files. PG Restore is a utility that gives us enormous amount of flexibility. Uh, the connection options are the same. It, it respects the same environment variables just like PG Dump and PG Dump all do. Some of the common options for PG Restore are, number one, we've always got to give it a database name. So we give it dash D or dash dash database, or I'm sorry, dash dash DB name and we give it the database name, we can tell it, for example, I could do a, a PG dump uh, and pipe that to, or set it to a custom file or a tar file, and I could take that tar file, even though it's a full dump of the database, so all the DDL, indexes, data, everything, and on, with PG restore, I can give it a dash A and say, I only want you to restore the data because I've, you know, I've already installed the DDL and so on and so forth. Um, like guys, we can do the clean and the create just like on, uh, on the way out, if you will, with PG dump. We can uh, specify individual indexes. So if we just wanted to restore a couple of indexes from a dump file, we could do that. Um, we can restore only the DDL 
we can restore individual schemas. We can tell it to disable the triggers when we do the restore, um, so on and so forth. A lot of the a lot of the the flags are the same, but it, it provides, I think an extra amount, if you will, of flexibility when you go to recover. So it doesn't mean that you have to recover. It's not an all or nothing thing. Um, likewise, we can specify individual tables, individual triggers. Uh, and you do have to specify the dash F and tell it, is this a custom file or is it a tar formatted file? Um, so it won't take, it won't take some straight No, it won't. The other thing, if you notice the, the last couple of, of items here, the dash L and the dash capital L, this gives you a really powerful way to create an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of what you might want to recover. And we'll get to that here momentarily. So here's a couple of restore examples. This first one restores the data only from a custom formatted file. And we're restoring it into a database called prod2 underscore db. Um, so we're giving it the PG restore, the dash A to say only restore the data. Um, we're telling it it's a custom formatted file. We're specifying the database name. And then we're giving it the dump file. Likewise, the second one does a clean. So it removes the data and the structures first. And then it restores only the gold partners schema um, from a tar formatted file. And the final example, we're restoring only the DDL i.e. the schema only um, into the QA1 underscore DB file from a custom formatted uh, dump file. And the dash J, uh, did we have it on this slide? The jobs, that's actually a parallel restore feature. So if I've got a, a, a database and let's say just for simplicity, I've got a thousand tables. If I specify dash J, and give it 10, it'll actually create 10 parallel jobs and it'll split those thousand tables up, um, you know, 100 per job, and it'll run all 10 jobs in parallel. So uh, what used to take in previous versions of Postgres eight hours to restore, we could potentially restore in two hours or 30 minutes or so, um, depending on how, how much parallelism your machine can handle. So the next big feature with uh, PG Restore is using table of, file, table of contents files. And that's the dash L and the dash capital L that I mentioned earlier. So if we have a dump and we've dumped it to either a tar or a custom formatted file, you can run uh, PG Restore on it. And you can, in this case, if you, you look at the second example here, uh, we're doing a, first we do a PG dump and we're doing a tar formatted file. And then we run PG restore and we give it a dash L on that dump file and then we're redirecting that to an output file. What's going to get redirected into that output file is a table of contents of what's in that dump. Um, and here's sort of an example of what you would see in that file. So the semicolons are comments. So you get a header that talks about how many entries are in this file and when was it created and so on and so forth. And then likewise, you'll get an entry for every object in that file. So if we look at this example, there's a, uh, uh, create, effectively a create schema. Um, there's a comment on the schema. There's a access control setting the permissions to be owned by Postgres. Uh, there's a public dbmon thresh table that's owned by Postgres and so on and so forth. A little further down, there's some set commands and there's a, a couple of data commands that are specifying these are the actual data restores as opposed to the table, the DDL restore. And there will be index entries in here and, and referential uh, foreign key entries and so on and so forth. So the way to deal with a table of contents file is you could effectively go into that file and comment out anything you don't want to restore and create a very custom restore, if you will. So you could restore in a set of specific tables and only restore data on some of those tables and, and restore indexes on all of them, but not the foreign keys on some of them, and so on and so forth. And then when you run the PG dump using the table of contents file, you get a, a very customized restore scenario. Um, 
What I used to do with, with this before we had parallel restore is I would take the table of contents file and split it up into multiple files and create my own parallel restore, which um, we don't need anymore, but that was kind of a cool feature as well. Here's a couple of examples. So we do a PG dump to a tar formatted file, and then we run the PG restore on that, creating the list file. And then we create this QADB3 database. We edit the list file uh, according to what we want to restore. And then we run the PG restore with a dash capital L, and give it the name of the list file, and then give it the rest of the parameters as, as normal, and it will restore only the, the data structures and the objects that are referenced in the list file. Any questions on? The question was, are all these features available in generic Postgres versus EDB's advanced server? The answer is yes. This is generic Postgres. Any other questions? So the question, uh, what are the advantages of the custom file? Number one, it's compressed. And number two, it's a binary file. So it's a more efficient restore because it's binary. And then, of course, just the compression. So um, next, we'll talk about point in time recovery. So Postgres doesn't necessarily have a, uh, a way of saying, uh, by the way, just turn point in time recovery on and let me deal with it later. However, it, it does have all the building blocks to let us put point in time recovery in place and leverage uh, a fair amount of flexibility in terms of how we want to recover come recovery time. So the basic things we need to do for a point in time recovery is, number one, we need to do point in time recovery based backups, which would uh, effectively be the equivalent of, say, a level zero backup. And then likewise, you need to tell the, the database server or the, your cluster to archive the wall segments, meaning every time one of your transaction logs gets full, we need an archived copy of that transaction log. Um, the combination of those two items, the, the effectively level zero backup, and some number of archived transaction logs allows us to recover to any point in time we define. Um, likewise, for a point in time recovery, basically restore the, la the latest base backup or the latest base backup that we want to leverage for our recovery. You have to do a little bit of preparation in the system data directory. Uh, and one of those things is we create a file called recovery.conf. Um, and basically, after we've identified how we want to recover, basically, you need to tell the recovery.conf file, where do, where do I find the wall segments, the archive transaction logs, and to what point in time, in its most simple terms, uh, do I want to recover to? And then you start the Postmaster. The Postmaster will find the recovery.conf file. It'll automatically roll into recovery mode. And once it's finished, um, it'll rename the recovery.conf file to recovery.done, and it'll come online. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, pretty simple, to be honest. So in order to do the backups, uh, here's sort of a walkthrough. So in this case, we go into our postgresql.conf file, and there's a couple of key parameters we need to change. So one is we need to turn archive mode to on. By default, archive mode is off, and changing archive mode requires that we restart the database server. Likewise, we need to give it an archive command. Um, the archive command can be any valid shell script or, I'm sorry, any valid uh, OS command. So if you're running on Linux, it can be a copy statement like we have here. It could be an rsync. It could be an SCP. Um, it, you could reference a shell script. Any valid OS command can go in there. Effectively, what we're trying to tell the database is uh, I'm going to reference via the percent %p variable, which means that's the full path to the actual source wall segment, meaning the transaction log. And the percent %f is the name of the file that it's going to give to the wall segment. So by using those two variables, we effectively try to tell the database engine, I want you to move the percent %p file to some other location. And that location can be whatever you want. In this case, we're doing a simple copy, and we're copying it to a directory called slash stage slash wall. Um, 
In a lot of cases, I've seen, in fact, even with our shop, we've done SCPs or we've done R syncs, which effectively move the wall, the wall segments, the archived transaction logs, off of the main database server onto a backup server somewhere. And that way, in case of a disaster, uh, if the disaster were significant enough that the disks were irrecoverable, uh, we haven't lost all of our wall segments with the crash. Likewise, there's, a, there's a, a variable called archive timeout. In most cases, we leave this to zero. However, if you tweak it, what it'll do is, let's say you set it to 30 seconds, what that'll do is every 30 seconds, it will make sure that if it hasn't already in the last 30 seconds, it will archive the current transaction log. Where this is useful is if you've got a, a database server that the traffic is light enough that you only rotate transaction logs like once a week. Um, and you don't want you know, half a week's worth of transactions, even though it's not all that many, you don't want those transactions sitting in the transaction log for that amount of time unarchived in the case of a, of a disaster. Um, there is a way to, if you can still get back to your original uh, directory tree where your database lived in a, in a crash scenario where you could recover those, but it's not a guarantee. So that's a, that's a nice feature if you have a light traffic machine. Um, the archive command and the archive timeout values can both be changed by doing a, uh, a reload as opposed to a restart of the database server. So for an example, uh, we would do a make dir on the stage wall directory. We would make sure that that directory is owned by Postgres. And assuming we had already made the, the, these three changes, uh, we would go ahead and restart the server. Once that's done, if we were in a let's test this scenario, we would want to create some transactions, generate some volume. At that point, we should start to see files show up in the stage wall directory. And they, they have a long name, but they're effectively archived version of your transaction logs. Um, the transaction logs are copied when one of two events takes place. Either the, your, or I'm sorry, the wall segments are copied when either the transaction log is full and it gets ready to rotate to the next log or when the number of seconds specified in our archive timeout has passed. So the next step would be we're archiving the transaction logs, our database server is back online. Now we need to do our base backup or our level zero backup. So what you would do is connect to Postgres and execute the function pg start backup. pg start backup requires a single parameter which is a tag and it doesn't matter what you put in that tag. Generally, when I do this, I'll put in the date as a string. However, you can put whatever you want in that tag. And there is some value in terms of having a, a formal naming convention for that tag. In extremely rare scenarios, you get into a place where you might not be able to recover based on a normal timeline or the actual timeline that took place. And you have to go back to previous uh, baseline backups, and in those cases, uh, you get into a scenario where it's important to understand what tag you gave it. In most cases, you'll never deal with it, but it is important to stick with a naming convention in case you ever get backed into a corner in a recovery scenario. Likewise, uh, so we run the, the, just like any function, we run select pg start backup, and then once that comes back, we go ahead and we archive uh, all of the directories that are associated with the database. So if you have your database, for example, installed in var live pgsql data, you would effectively back up the data directory. Also, if you have external table spaces, let's say you have a, a, a file system called slash pg data, and in there you've created several external table spaces, you also need to back that up. So any, any parts of the file system where you have Postgres data installed is what you want to back up. Uh, you can back it up with tar. You could rsync it to another box. You could SCP it. It really doesn't matter. Just back it up. Once you're finished with the backup, then you connect to the database server again, and you execute the function pg stop backup. pg stop backup doesn't take any parameters, and 
effectively what you're telling the database is this is the point in time where I started and when I finished doing the actual file system copy for my base backup. Then, of course, if we were testing this, we would want to generate some more transactions, make sure that we had transaction logs that were archived on both sides of the backup just to make sure we're fully testing the scenario. Um, and then we roll into recovery. So let's say our database crashes or we want to create another instance on, say, a QA box or what have you. Um, the first thing you want to do in the case of a crash is if you're able to still get to the original data directory, you want to get in there and copy the pgxlog directory and save it off somewhere if, if you can get to it. What that'll buy us is any transactions that were in that last transaction log that didn't have a chance to get archived, we'll have an opportunity to re restore those transactions. And in that case, if we were doing a full recovery of everything, we weren't specifying a timestamp, we would recover anything that had been committed, and we would only lose uncommitted transactions. Uh, if, however, your disk is just unusable, you can't get to it at all, then you're going to lose uh, not only uncommitted transactions, but any transactions that were in that last transaction log. Um, number two here, ensure that the postmaster is not running. That's key if you are able to get back to disk and you had some catastrophe take place, but you're rebuilding the database server back onto the same box. Um, in most cases, you're going to, uh, it's likely that you will have rebooted that box in between, but that's not a guarantee either. So make sure that the, there are no orphaned or in some other way non-responsive postmaster processes running on the box. Likewise, if if we were able to copy the original data directory, I'm sorry, um, if we can copy the original data directory, we want to copy that. However, uh, what we're doing is, oh, I'm sorry, I covered that. Uh, we're just going after the, the, the PGX log directory. So if you look at the documentation, it talks about copying the data directory, the original one, but in reality, all you need is the PGX log directory. Nothing else is going to be a benefit to you in that directory at this point. Um, if we were doing an rsync, then we can skip these next two steps. However, if we, for example, say we tarred up when we did our base backup, the directories, and then moved that tar file to another box, uh, obviously we want to remove the data directory and any table space directories, and that would be if we're recovering back to the same box. And then we want to restore our last system backup. Effectively, what we're looking to do here is take our base backup and lay it down on disk in the same way that it looked like on the server that crashed. So whether that's back onto the same physical box or not, it doesn't matter, um, but you want to lay things down in the same fashion. So if you uh, backed up everything from a data directory, say it's in var live data, um, you, it's, it's to your best advantage to keep it simple to lay that back into a directory var live data. It's not required. There are some tweaks you can do to, to make it come up in, in a different directory path configuration, but in some cases it requires you to go in and, and uh, tweak some things. So um, anyway, you uncompress your backup or whatever you need to do to restore your base backup. And key things are you want to make sure that your permissions are retained and you want to make sure that if you've created external table spaces that the symbolic links in the PG table space directory, which is in the Postgres cluster data directory, make sure that those are still appropriate. So for example, if you had table spaces on the original box and they were mounted, let's say on a SAN, and your mount point on that box was slash PG data, but when you set up your recovery box, the SAs gave you a mount that says slash PG data 2. Um, that's okay, but you need to go into your PG table space directory and reset those table, table space links. Uh, they're just soft links in the directory. They're not hard to figure out, but you need to make sure that those are appropriate. Um, next thing you want to do is, is in the data directory that you just recovered, you restored your tar file or what have you, go into the pgxlog directory and we need to get rid of everything. Um, with the exception of there's a directory within that directory 
The only thing you want to leave is the pgx log directory itself and the pgx log slash archive status directory. Uh, the, the reason is you took that base backup, let's say two weeks ago, that pgx log directory is in the state of when you took that backup. So um, to leave those uncommitted or I'm sorry, unarchived transactions in the same state as the point in time you took the backup will just confuse the issue. So get rid of everything in there. The next thing you do is if you were able to save your original pgx log directory, you would effectively copy that straight into what's now your new pgx log directory. That's what's going to allow you to recover any transactions that have been committed but not yet archived. Um, next thing we do is we create a file in the data directory called recovery.conf. And we'll go over the options for that in a couple of slides. As an option, and I always do this, I will modify the pghba.conf to lock everybody out that I possibly can. So I'll, I'll lock everyone out except for the Postgres user for local connections. So unfortunately, if, if the, there's applications or jobs on the local server that run as Postgres and connect locally, they're still going to try to connect. The only downside, it's not a big deal, but the only downside to that is every time someone tries to connect, when you're running a recovery, the application gets an error back and you get some entries in the logs for these errors. So if, if there's a lot of connections trying to ping the database server, while you're trying to monitor progress, you start to have to filter through all these error messages, which just becomes a pain. It's not a problem per se, it's just uh, not helpful. Then you start the server. The server will find the recovery.conf file. It'll roll into recovery mode. If you tell the Postgres log, or if you're going to syslog, if you tell the var log messages, or wherever you're pushing your Postgres logs, um, you will see the recovery in action. And once it's finished, it'll rename the recovery.conf to recovery.done, and it'll come online. You'd want to poke around as DBA and po just make sure that the data looks good, that maybe do some counts, make sure that everything looks kosher. And then if you uh, did option eight here, you'd want to go ahead and res restore the hba.conf file to its original state. And at that point, everybody's good to go. Everyone should be able to connect. Uh, and your data should be as you specified in the recovery.conf file. In the recovery.conf file, there's a couple of key parameters we need to specify. One of them is the actual restore command. So in our case, we, when we archived our wall segments, we were copying from the internal Postgres data directory to a directory called slash stage slash wall. So the assumption is that we still have a slash stage slash wall on this box or we've mounted it so it's still that same name. So in this case, the, the first restore command you see here is just a simple copy, slash stage, slash wall, slash percent F, which is the wall segment file name. And we're copying it to percent P, which is the internal transaction log location inclusive of its full path. Uh, likewise, the restore command could be a shell script. And you could do some additional checking before you actually pass that or move that file to its right location. It could be a, an SCP command. It really doesn't matter. Just like with archiving the wall segments, this can be any valid OS command that will, at the end of it, actually move the wall segment into the transaction log directory. Postgres will actually call this command for every file that it knows it needs and it will pass in the appropriate values for the percent %f and the percent %p each time. There's also a, a, a variable you can specify a recovery target time. If you leave this out, the default is to recover everything it can find. However, if you put a timestamp in here, it will recover up to inclusive of any transactions that were committed on or before that timestamp. Likewise, there's a couple of other parameters that you're less likely to use. Um, one of them is the recovery target transaction ID. And you can specify an individual transaction ID and say, I want to recover up through this 
transaction ID. One thing to note is that when transaction IDs are generated, they're generated sequentially, but they're not necessarily committed sequentially. So if you, it's feasible that you could generate transaction ID uh, 105 by doing a begin statement, and before you do your commit, 87 other transactions have not only begun but also committed, then you're, you're, you're out of sequence at that point. So just an FYI, be careful when you specify a transaction ID if you have that kind of visibility into your system. Um, I haven't had any experience with doing the transaction ID recoveries uh, or to be honest with the uh, recovery target timeline, which is another one. If you have to specify a recovery target timeline, it means that you're in a world of hurt as a DBA. Um, it means that something's gone really, really wrong and you physically can't recover the base backup and the set of wall segments you have based on the timeline that actually occurred as they were backed up. So you can specify effectively an alternate timeline and at least get the database to come online and then you can go to your boss and say, well, we're back, but, um, but at least you get to say we're back. Uh, so there is a lot of documentation on this one. It's, it gets really complicated really fast and you need to have some real visibility into um, how the transactions occurred in terms of being able to try to construct an alternate timeline. Uh, hopefully you never have to go there, but it's available if you do. There's also a parameter called log restart points. It's a Boolean. Uh, it doesn't do anything in terms of the recovery itself. All it does is basically set a verbose flag, if you will, in terms of what it logs as it's doing the recovery. So if you have some particularly long running transactions and you turn this on, it actually gives you the ability to see things progress. So you don't have to sit and stare at the keyboard for an hour and a half before you see that it's actually doing something. Um, nothing more than logging for that scenario. Uh, and at that point, you should have a, a, a running server back online and hopefully all your data is intact. I've, I've done point in time recovery untold number of times and never had a single issue. I've done it both with uh, full recovery, not specifying a timestamp, just recover everything. And I've also done it by specifying a timestamp. And uh, in general, it's been flawless. Uh, um, thanks, everybody. Uh, we're uh, a little over, but no worries.